watching Love Shouldn't Hurt. My name is Hilary Platt. I'm your host. On this show, we talk about issues and topics related to domestic abuse. Today, I am very honored and privileged to have Bernadette Mall on as our guest. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Bernadette actually was one of my first phone calls into the domestic violence community. She welcomed me in and Bernadette trained me for my 40 hours domestic violence response team and continues to always be there as a mentor and to help me with any questions. And so I was thrilled when she said she would come on our show. And I thought that I would let you explain what your job description is now. Okay. I work for the Camden County Women's Center. I am the municipal court advocate. I go to the municipal courts in Camden County to assist victims of domestic violence with understanding what their options are, what's going to happen, the procedures that'll take place, with safety planning, with um, resource information, and, and anything else that may come up that they need. So why would um, a domestic violence victim be going to the municipal court and not maybe the Hall of Justice in Camden? The way domestic violence legal system works is if a victim comes into a police station and there is a charge filed against their abuser, they'll go either to municipal court, depending on the level of the crime, or they'll go to superior court for a fourth degree or higher crime. Right. They'll go to the Hall of Justice for a restraining order issue, which is a civil event that's heard through family court. Right. They're two very distinct events. So they might have to do both. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, you work for several, through Kim County Women's Center, you advocate in several different towns, different courts? I am an employee of the Camden County Women's Center. Mm -hmm. We are funded to provide this service in Camden County, mm -hmm. and we can go to any of the Camden County courts, any of the Camden County Municipal Courts. Right. Um, we do have some that have larger numbers, um, the way the scheduling works out. There are some that I am in more often than others, mm -hmm. but it's not unusual to find me in any of them. So about how many cases do you, or how many victims do you deal with a day? A uh, day is tough because of the way the court schedule works out, but I average about 80 or 90 victims a month. Wow. Mm -hmm. So what is the average situation that you see? Or actually, let me go back. Okay. Explain to our audience what would fall under domestic violence okay. law. The Prevention of Domestic Violence Act has certain relationships that qualify as domestic violence relationships. They are, and I always forget a couple, so you're gonna have to help me okay. out. Married, child in common, dating, formerly dating, formerly married, household members, I think that's everybody. These relationships. Roommates? That's household members, got it. These relationships, these allow for the Prevention of Domestic Violence Act to come into play. There's 14 acts of domestic violence that fall into this. Assault, aggravated assault, I never get all 14. Assault, aggravated assault, criminal mischief, harassment. Right. Um, criminal restraint. Criminal restraint, kidnapping. Lewdness, which I really don't know what that is still, but. It's being creepy. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, There's it's a bunch there. of those out there. Yes, there are. <laughs> um, these 14 acts, when they, when they occur within these relationships, allow for two things to happen. You can get the civil end of things, which is the restraining right. order, and you qualify potentially qualify for a restraining order protection. Right. Um, and like any other time this crime has occurred, you can also go through the criminal justice system, which is when they address the actual criminality of the act. The Hall of Justice part of it, the restraining order part of it, is where you address the reliefs that come from that aside from the criminal court. Okay. So let's say you're in court mm -hmm. and there's a victim there that got punched in the face. Mm -hmm. Did that victim press the charges against the abuser? That depends. New Jersey is a mandatory arrest state. If a 
if an officer has reason to believe that domestic violence has occurred, then the officer will sign the charge. Generally, that's complaint of pain or injury. Now, if you go to the police and you report, yes, I was punched in the face by somebody who qualifies as that relationship. Right. Um, and there's a you know, you know, big black guy. Right. Chances are the officer will sign that charge. Right. There's no complaint of pain and no injury. Say you come up and say, I was in a verbal argument and somebody was calling me all kinds of horrible names. The officer might not press that charge. Right. So if you press it, you could go to municipal court. If the officer presses it, you could go to municipal court. So what happens if somebody's fighting in their home and let's say the neighbors call the police mm -hmm. and the officer shows up mm -hmm. and they have to, do they have to decide who right there in that split second, who's the victim? The who's... officer has an obligation to determine what's called primary aggressor. Um, party. Domestic violence is about power, and it's about an imbalance of power. Right. So when you have this terrible imbalance of power and you're charging both people, and you're not really assisting you're subjecting her to the same criminal standards as her abuser right. or his abuser. So let's say it's obvious. The police officer goes to a home and he sees that the abuser has no physical signs, mm -hmm. even though it's difficult to delineate sometimes. you have to The officers are very well trained right. for, for determining right. primary aggressors. So, it's not an easy task. Right. Days. So let's say they decide that the, just for sake of this argument, that the husband beat up the wife. Mm -hmm. Then they would automatically press charges against the husband. If the, yes, if there's signs of injuries and the officer, the relationship exists, the officer would sign the charge. And what if the wife doesn't want those charges? The officer has an obligation under the mandatory arrest policies to sign the charge. And I know you've explained this to me before. I think it's it's wonderful. So would you explain to the audience why there's that obligation, what it does for the victim? The the mandatory arrest policy, by having the officer sign the charge, you take the responsibility of that from the victim, which adds a level of safety for the victim because the victim is not the one saying, oh, you're going to get in trouble. Right. Um, and it's convenient in court proceedings because then the victim sometimes coerced, sometimes penalized, sometimes punished, all sorts of horrible things. You better drop that charge. Right. If you don't drop that charge, you're in big trouble. Right. The victim gets to go into court and see, it's not my charge to drop. I can't do it. This would be the state versus you, not me versus you. And so there's a level of safety with it. So, so interesting um, about keeping the victim safe and making sure that the victim can regain some of that control. Mm -hmm. um, I was talking to my coworker that I was having you on, and she, and she's not part of Project Sarah through JFCS, which is our domestic abuse division. Um, she's in a totally different program, and she said to me, "Well." I think that the court should mandate the victims to get counseling and get help and 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 you had a very and, nice discussion about victim blaming. I did very so, nice. and and about revictimizing. So mm -hmm. I thought maybe you could we can shed address some light on that. Um, aside from putting the response, I saw the blood yes. starting to come up. Yeah, does it show? <laughs> yes. no, I bet well doing. She um, she's blaming the victim and she's putting the responsibility. Um, I'm sorry if you're listening. <laughs> you're putting the responsibility for that behavior on the victim. And instead of asking why is she tolerating this and why don't we make her do something, let's address him. It's his behavior. Right. So, And the court has no jurisdiction over the victim in making her do anything. She's not charged with a crime. Right. She's not charged with anything. She's not convicted of anything. She's not, she didn't do anything. Right. So the court can't just wander up. How mad would you be? Oh, you know what? I'm sorry. Some stranger punched you in the face. I'm going to make you go to counseling. Right. You know what? Let's make a couple's counseling while we're at it. Right. <laughs> and explain the irony in that, which a lot of people don't realize why, if you're in an abusive relationship, you shouldn't have couple's counseling. We don't do couple's counseling because, once again, domestic violence is about a power imbalance. Right. One person in the relationship has more power than the other. When we go to couples counseling, we're putting these two people in the same room and assuming they have the same ability to address their issues. 
and they don't mm -hmm. um, you can't expect that yes sir. I have a question certainly um, you know this is Keith <laughs> I, I'm Keith. the one who always asks questions you know um, as far as power uh, is there ever a situation where you know okay uh, maybe the man the male has power in a certain part of the relationship and a woman has the other power in the relationship but it's not balanced to where now they're clashing versus like you know what I mean what, to where are you talking about that in terms of domestic violence or in terms of relationship well, concerns well I was curious because you said you don't put them together okay in a let me explain domestic violence I should okay. probably go back a few steps what we're primarily talking about is a concept called coercive control Okay. where one person is controlling the behaviors of another through certain tactics those tactics when they are no longer effective like isolation um, isolation humiliation there's eight or ten of those also right um, when those tactics stop working that's things tend to get physical and the physical is intended to make somebody behave in a particular manner gotcha okay. I'm not I'm not punching Since you because they feel like it I'm punching you because you didn't do what you were told and next time you're going to yeah. do that, and you're going to be afraid that if you don't do that, I'm going to punch you in the head again. When you're talking about, like, you know, he may have power over, you know, which cars we drive, and she may have power over where the kids go to school, we don't have that same imbalance. We just have different. So that would be where, powers. you know, that would be couples counseling, what I'm probably pretty much going towards, because there, there is a balance. No, no one feels, um, no one is really controlling the whole yes. relationship yes. you're, not, you're not talking about a, a, an abuse of power you're talking about we haven't exactly figured out how we want to, to work together right mm -hmm. now we have a relationship and, and just for those listeners out there is there as far as when you're being uh, abused is there any working it out I mean there's no there's no cure for it. It, it you really pretty much have to be separated from that I mean oh in your opinion there is batterers counseling, um, which and the batterers counseling that we have access to in Camden County is an amazing counseling session. It's, I believe it's based on the, I'm going to say Montreal, but I could be wrong on that. And we had, that? we had Jack Lefschnoff here for um, Cooper Against Domestic Abuse, and Jack was saying how one of the most important recipes for someone who's an abuser to learn a different way of coping skills and to not be an abuser anymore is that they have to own it. They have to recognize it and they have to be willing to do the work and go to this batter's intervention. And I was going to ask Fern to explain the difference between batter's intervention and anger management. And to be fair, I defer all real in-depth batterer's intervention questions to the Family Violence Prevention Program, which is run by Will DeBose and which the Volunteers of America. Okay. And he's just, he's my guru for, for, for batterer's intervention questions. We don't send people to anger management because anger management, generally speaking, is when you're a jerk to everybody. It's right. not about control, it's about you're a jerk. Um, and I can yell at you, and I can yell at you, and I can yell at my spouse. For batterer's intervention, that is intimate partner abuse. And I think we've gotten away from the domestic abuse concepts and, and those, those titles, and we have started using intimate partner abuse more often. And that's the difference between anger management and, and inappropriate behavior right. in general and, and, and specifically. Ray Rice was a great example for that because he doesn't get up and pummel someone who might say something to Egamon on the field or his coach that criticizes him or maybe somebody cuts him off in traffic. He saved it for his intimate partner. So that's the difference between the anger management and, and being an abuser. Well, that's almost like being a bully then. It's a lot I mean, like being yes. a bully. You're, you're being a bully. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a good point. And um, Gloucester Township um, has great program set up where if someone is found to be a bully in the public school system they will set up they have a program set up so that they can meet with a social worker work through these programs try to change their coping mechanisms not to be a bully because it their chances of growing up to be an abuser will increase if that's not taken care of is that project battle or project mars project Battle Project Mars is um, missing and at risk, right? 
Let me ask you, ladies, another question. Do you? How much do you feel that, um, you know, the public eye plays a lot of um, havoc with this? And the re what I'm saying is, like, look, um, we're supposed to be the land of opportunity, but yet in the politician arena, like, I can watch someone bully President Obama, you know, kind of egg him, egg him on, or, or just different things like kids get off on seeing. Uh, people will injure themselves and doing stuff like that. It, like, it almost like sells. Do you, do you think that eggs people on? Well, I think it can skew your point of view, which is why I think that a lot of organizations are going towards education, preventative, talking to the teens, mm -hmm. talking to the parents about what we're talking to their teens mm -hmm. about, and learning how to process all that information that you see on TV. You know, we're not saying because you might see something violent, you're gonna go out and do something violent. Um, or the songs that they hear in pop culture. Absolutely. Half the time they don't even know what the words are. They like the beat, they might like, you know, a couple. It, it's true, and what we have to do is say to the parents and say to the kids, you know, don't freak out. This is what's going on with those words. Um, explain to them what they mean and don't perpetuate it. Just know the difference and know I guess to have that moral compass. Yeah, because there's that 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 rapper that's actually going to be. Well, I think he was arrested, and they're trying to say that his music promotes gang violence. And I say, the people that are committing the violent acts are violent people, and really, you know, for whatever reason, shouldn't be in society. I mean, I don't. That's my, that's my opinion. I don't think that it really matters. I think it's it's within that person. I generally have to have my kids explain what the words are because I have no <laughs> clue what the hell they're saying. So I'm like, what? Uh, I like the one song, and then, and then I found out it was about chocolate. Like, really? Uh, but it's so cute. Um, yeah, the other one. The, the other one has it. something about somebody's shoes. Yeah, and um, a bullet. And it wait, was a wait. Really cute tune. Yeah, well, I, I loved it. My daughter's looking at me. She's like, really? You better run. Better that one. Run. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And now someone explained to me that it was about a school shooting. Yeah. And I went, yeah, right, I was right. disappointed. Yeah. And so. Now, I always ask this, and I'll let the floor back to Hillary because I always start getting it, but I ask everybody that comes on Hill's show, you know, do, in your opinion, do you think it's le learned behavior or it's behavior that's already there? In I, your opinion. That's a great question. I, I think that some behaviors are learned, um, but I, I, I'm very reluctant to paint everything with a broad brush. Right. Um, you know, people say, you know, how, is, how do your victims handle the... Every victim is a different event for me, mm -hmm. and I don't want to attribute your situation to Hillary, to me. Um, so, you know, for some people, I think it's a learned behavior. For some people, I think, you know, that's just how they are. And, you know, if you have somebody who grew up with the only thing they ever knew was bullying, you know, maybe we can teach them to recognize their trigger points and to recognize what sets them off and to understand various things. And other people might just be bad. Now, you teach them their trigger or what their trigger points are. Uh, you know, do you ever try to take the person that's being abused and... I was just going to bring that up, Keith. Talk down, you know, like uh, maybe there's words that you, they can use. It's almost like a hypnotist, you know. You, you know, you say something and then now it's, you know... Are, are, are you asking, do we teach... How do you de-escalate a situation? But there do we go. teach the victims to de-escalate? Yeah, well, like, say say that, say that the victim... Or the, the, say that the abuser, um, you know, maybe um, when this person does something, I, I don't know, triggers... And I'll, I'll use the guy. He tr sh the, the, the wife tr does something and triggers the... the I need husband. you to listen to that statement again. Okay, say that... I know because I'm trying to get the words out to make well, sure it makes no, sense. you said when the wife does something to trigger his behavior. Right. You're putting the responsibility for his behavior back well, on her. Well, no, that's what I'm saying. But in a roundabout way, if something is making him, setting him off, okay, and that's, because I'm going, like you're saying about a trigger. Well, give me an example of what might set him off. Like, let's say... Uh, when he, you know what, um, maybe when he comes home, dinner's not on the table. Okay, so let's put dinner on the table. Then what's going to set him off? Okay. Well, no, I'm saying if... No, we, good, keep okay, going. So, this is a good... Okay. Or maybe... Um, maybe uh, All right, so they've had dinner. Done. They've had dinner. Okay, done. the laundry's done. Now what's going to set him off? Nothing. Everything. Well, I mean, well, everything. Anything. Right, anything. that's the point. point. The point is that it's not, it's not the laundry, it's not the house, it's not that the place is a mess. 
it's that he's choosing to do this behavior at this time. People, women, particularly in, in those types of abusive relationships, do what's called walking on eggshells, mm -hmm. and they will try to anticipate every need, every issue, every concern. Right. You can't do it because it's not going to matter if the bed is made this way, if it's made that way. It doesn't matter if the toilet's clean, if the toilet's dirty. It's not about that. And, and maybe that's a, and you know you, that's a great point. But maybe what I was trying to say is is there something to where she realizes that he's just having that bad day and nothing's going to yeah. work. When when these actions start, is mm -hmm. there something that I don't know, like that commercial, the Snickers commercial, where you know they have <laughs> when they hand them a Snickers. How many times people give me Snickers bars? Goes <laughs> 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 with my Diet Coke. Yeah, so um, I mean, not to make what, light okay, of it, but what you're, what you're talking, what, you, what I think you're getting at, like I'm shrinking them. Can you teach them to shrink them back to where it doesn't is, stop? Is is there a survival technique? Yeah, yeah, that's that's. that's I think, and I think that's, that's what you're getting at. Yeah, I'll yeah, stop yeah. picking on you now because that's right. a good question. Because yeah. <laughs> um, he's definitely for you gave me an opportunity. <laughs> Um, there are women who are in domestic violence situations, a lot of times people don't understand why they do the things that they do. Right. Um, well, because that's how you live. That's how you survive. Um, you know, why did you make the bed seven times? Because that's how I survived this day. Why did you take the punch? Because the kids didn't have to exactly, take it. Exactly, exactly. And people who are in these situations get very adept at reading the signals they need to read and doing what they need to do to survive that day right. with as little violence as they can possibly get through it with. But when you were talking about counseling, we we do offer Camden County Women's Center, JFCS, we offer counseling to the victims or the survivors um, because, first of all, I equate living with an abuser to living in a war zone for all mm -hmm. those years. and. And, you know, just like a soldier coming home from war, this person is going to have it's trauma. a lot of trauma to deal with. Um, in addition to that, I find that sometimes when you sit down with a, a survivor and you peel away the layers, they might have had the most amazing childhood brought up with the most loving family. Or they might have grown up and thought that that was the norm to be abused and controlled. Um, so you try to have them come to their realizations and maybe realize that they are an amazing person and they deserve the best and not um, be as vulnerable and good pickings for someone who is controlling. Because I truly don't feel like the victim picks the abuser. I feel like the abusers hone in and they know who might either be extremely apathetic, might put themselves last, um, might maybe not speak up or or comes from a household where they're they're used to being bullied and they, they hone in and they pick that that victim. So those are just some of the things that you can work through with counseling. And and in addition to, to that type of counseling, there's also the psychoeducational counseling. A lot of people don't know what domestic violence victim or domestic violence is. Right. Um, one of the tools that we use is called the power and control wheel. And the first time people see that, they're like, oh my, I right. can't believe it, I'm the here, light bulb I'm here, goes I'm here. on. Yeah, and yeah. they get more of a view of how these tactics have over time produced what's going on now. Um, right. So a lot of it is, is training on that. You'll have to one raise more, your hand, one more, core, one more question, I promise. Keith that. is raising his hand, so we'll call on him. <laughs> you can shout out. One more question. Do you feel that there's a particular industry that or job out there that increases this behavior? I do not. You know, like they always say, like, uh, you know, believe it or not, police officers have such a rough job that they, they it's hard for them to kind of separate. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, just with people with high stress jobs, anything, just your thoughts, your opinion. A high stress job does not make you abusive. Okay. Some abusive people may tend towards the jobs that have more authority or give them a position where they can be control. more physical. Um, but being a police officer does not make you an abusive person. And I think that a lot of times we, we hear more about that. The penalties for, for, for being an abuser as an officer are severe. Absolutely. And I think that we, we just tend to hear that more. But I haven't found any one pr profession that 
you know, when I say, and so when, what do you do for a living? I don't get any one answer more than another. Well, you know, at one, to at one point I know like uh, Wall Street was like, uh, they had the highest suicide rate for, for business, mm -hmm. business people or whatever, stuff like that. So I didn't know if there was figures out there or not. Not to my knowledge. So with seeing the kind of people that you see in court, um, do you see, are there any males that are victims? There are some male victims. My statistics run about 15% male. Okay, and that's just people that are reported. Mm -hmm. So I can imagine there must be more. I gotta ask this other question. Do you, you know, <laughs> there's male victims, but do you find like, look, I mean, we're into 2014 where, you know, you have, you know, gay and lesbian couples. Mm -hmm. Do you see that? Absolutely. I mean, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, it's a dynamic, so it really doesn't matter the gender. It doesn't yeah. matter the gender, right? So that they could yeah. be. Yeah, it's all, it's, like I say, it's all about those power and control tactics. And, then, which, and you know, we started on that, and I have a bad habit of, of wandering away from my thoughts. We started talking about coercive control is the type of domestic violence that we usually refer to. Right. But there's also episodic, which you'll hear, well, it only happened once. Maybe it did. Can that person be fixed? Maybe it was only once. Right. And the other is um, mutual, mutual fighting, which there's no control and balance in mutual fighting. Just a little bit of control balance in episodic. And in coercive control, that's where we see the big skew. So, what do you do about the um, the when it's the both of them fighting like that? From a domestic violence standpoint, yeah. I think that's um, that's a difficult one to deal with. Yeah. Um, because they, do you often see that? No, we don't see it too much in court because yeah. I don't think that makes it to court as much as the others. Right. Episodic, um, when it happens once and it doesn't happen again, that's when people are startled. And right. Like, Oh my, I can't believe this happened, and the right. phone call comes quickly, and, and they're surprised, and they're shocked, and both parties are, I, I don't know how this happened. Right. I think those relationships are much, we, we get that person into counseling, and this person into education, we have a really great shot. Right. Um, there's less trauma involved in that. Right. They haven't been beaten down for such a long period of time. Right. So, um, so speaking of education, mm -hmm. you see the um, judges presiding in court, hearing all these cases mm -hmm. and having to determine a lot of different factors. Mm -hmm. Do the judges get training in domestic violence? Judges, all judges get trained in domestic violence. Family court judges, I know they have at least one full day, it might be more than that, and I know that because I've been to their training. Oh, okay. Um, and they have, every year they have mandatory training on domestic violence right. and it's really good training. Yeah. Our municipal court judges also have judge school every year and they are constantly updating their skills. I would say in Camden County we have some really good judges who really know and get domestic violence. Right. Um, and are, are more than willing to discuss it. Right. So yeah. Judges I'm do have training and our officers are required to have, they have the training in the academy and they have four hours updated training per year and I've been part of those trainings, and I think they're really good trainings also. So what happens if there, let's add another layer to the di dynamic, if there's kids involved? If, if there's kids involved, does the court require that something happens with that dynamic? So, someone also said to me, well, will the kids get taken away? Does DIFUS automatically get called? Depends. DIFUS, if we're talking about... DCP and P, sorry. Yes. DCP and P, um, and our thoughts are with them today. That was a yes. scary, scary event. Our thoughts go out family. to um, a DCP and P worker that got attacked in Camden and stabbed brutally with a I knife. saw that on the news. Mm -hmm. And she's currently in... Um, in she's, she's, she's on life support. She's fighting for her life. Yeah. Is she so, really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's scary. Um, but as far as, as domestic violence and child abuse, oh, we talked about Sasha Foundation. Domestic violence and child abuse, a child simply being in the house isn't necessarily considered child abuse because they're hearing an argument. Right. And DIFUS has, DCPP, has changed their protocols over the last few years to some, if you're in a domestic violence situation and you're your 
you've taught your children that when you hear the yelling start, run and hide. Right. That's a survival skill, right. and you're you're trying to protect them as a parent. So Dyfus is trying now to not re-victimize the non-offending parent. That's their policy. Right. So simply because you're in a house where domestic violence occurs, that doesn't mean you're going to lose your kids. Right. You do still have an obligation to keep your kids safe. Right. Mm. And it gets a little, gets a little yeah. tough. And I know we have to go, but just real quick, another layer that makes it so much more complicated and is a, a huge barrier as to why victims stay also is because of their pets. Yes. And we did have Phil Arco on our show. Amazing man. He is amazing, and through your training is how I found him. And he talks about the correlation between pet abuse mm -hmm. and domestic abuse. The, the, he does the um, domestic violence, elder abuse, child abuse, and animal abuse. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we've done, I'm going to do a shout out for myself now. One of the things that we've done in, in our area is we've started the Sasha Foundation mm -hmm. to help people who are in domestic violence situations and are having difficulties getting out of that because there's no place to keep their pet. Mm -hmm. Sasha Foundation will foster the animals until those people can get situated where they can take their animals back. So you guys are up and running. We are up and running enough that we can do that. So we're still we're still forming a lot of things. Okay, so um, are you looking for people that you will vet that will become foster parents? We are looking for volunteers to foster. We're looking for volunteers to do pretty much everything. Do you want to maybe give a number out to people that they can call if they're interested in? If you're interested in helping with the Sasha Foundation, right now the best thing to do would probably be email me. And that is at burnmall, B-E-R-N-M-A-U-L-L, -L, at yahoo.com. Let's just say that one more time. Burnmall, B-E-R-N-M-A-U-L-L, -L, at yahoo.com. And I will get back to you with our information. And any groomers out there, too. We did have a client that um, was going into... Um, a housing situation and had a dog and we got that dog room so that it would be nice and clean it's for the housing good. situation so mm -hmm. like you said all different kinds of help and we're gonna wrap up um, if you do have any questions about anything domestic violence related you can always call my office it's at 963-5668 and if you need immediate assistance we have a 24-hour hotline at 856-227 one, two, three, four. Right. And of course, remember Jew Jewish Family and Children's Service. We have our domestic abuse division. You can always call and ask for Sarah. Um, we're nine to five. We're not 24 hours, so, but whoever answers the phone will know uh, where to send that call off to if you say you're asking for Sarah at 856. 424-1333. And that's also what I love about um, our um, unfortunate industry that we're in, but that everybody works with each other, and Absolutely. It's, it's pretty amazing that we all help each other. Yes. So, yes, it's necessary. Yeah. Really all right. Well, our time is up. Thank you okay. so much, Bernadette. Thank you, Valerie. And it's been fun. Thank, yeah, it has the. We went over because, of course, we could talk way too much. <laughs> and remember, love shouldn't hurt.